This morning on a coast-to-coast -coast broadcast of the Mutual Broadcasting System, it is our pleasure to pay a tribute to a gentleman who's sitting at our microphones here now in the Department of the Interior Building. I'd like to repeat again that tribute before we start this little discussion, Mr. Jackson. We said this morning, one of America's grand old men has a birthday this week. He will be 98 years old Friday. Think of that, lacking only two years of being a century old. I think it's safe to say that no one in the world living today has looked upon the things this man has seen. No man will ever see them again, for William Henry Jackson is part and parcel of America's old West. It was 75 years ago, way back in 1866, that he worked his way west on the Oregon Trail as a bullwhacker. He was the first man who ever took pictures in the Yellowstone country. With his camera and with his able brush, he has photographed and painted a record of our early West that would not exist otherwise. He went as a bullwhacker with the Mormons to Salt Lake. He was with a mule freight outfit that lugged stuff over the mountains to a little village called Los Angeles. He rode herd on Mustangs around another little village called Omaha. Because this man had the eye of an artist and the instinct of a historian, we have a better understanding today of the beginning of our great West. Much of the development of the West was aided by his work. A magnificent and full life you've had, William Henry Jackson, and here's thanks and the nation's best wishes to you on your 98th birthday. That was in the broadcast this morning. And now we're very happy, Mr. Jackson, that you're here with us now and can tell us in your own words some of these things that I know you would like to have us know. Well, on your last trip across the West, did you notice any changes in the character and the vigor of the grass from that which you observed in the 70s? Well, that's been called to my attention uh, lately by modern pictures that people have sent me from the Conservation uh, uh, Society. There I've called to mind the great difference of the luscious grass that we used to camp on, which are now dusty plains, some parts of the middle western Wyoming. Well, do you remember how the cowboys handled their trail herds in the great cattle drives between Texas and Montana? I'm now engaged in painting a picture covering that very subject, showing the uh, big uh, drive of the old Longhorn period up across the old Chisholm Trail into Wyoming. That's as you remember it. Yes. Yeah. I, I only crossed the trail. I didn't follow it. I see. Now, just when did sheep begin to compete seriously with cattle? Oh, along the late 80s and 90s. And you were a part of all those yeah. differences of opinion yeah, yeah. that took place at that time. I am uh, more acquainted with that country before the, before the cowboy came in, even. Mm -hmm. I like to that, think of that period before the cowboy period. The cowboys began to come in during the 70s, mm -hmm. and they had the full sway for the next 10 years. And then they began to compete with the homesteaders and the... Uh, and the, uh, and the and the and the cowboy and the uh, and the cowboys. Well, now, did you uh, actually see any of these old range wars that took place? No, I people? never. But the Johnson County War, as they call it, in Wyoming, that was well, a little bit out of my territory. We were up in the mountains more. My work with the geological survey was almost entirely in the mountains, and not so much on the plains. Where all, that, uh, where all that warfare occurred. You've seen lots of buffalo, I expect. Oh, you? millions of them. Would you like to tell us about what those herds looked like when you oh, saw them? Oh, a great mass of uh, dark brown animals moving, grazing across the plain. When I first, <coughs> when I first saw a great herd, it was the first year the country Pacific ran across the plain and we ran through them all day long. Passing through Buffalo, I had to stop the train to get them off the track. Uh, they stopped the se several times. There were fires you could see in the distance on those flat plains. In the extreme distance, you could still see them moving on. You mean this was just one herd that took the entire day for the train? Well, to pass they were all. It wasn't a herd really. It's a whole mass of, uh, of buffalo. One great mass of them all came together. Not in different herds, but one great movement covering miles of territory. Would you estimate how many might be in such a... Oh, very impossible to guess. Well, Some people uh, call it millions, but that's rather excessive. Uh, did you see the hunting of the buffalo? Oh, thousands. Uh, what was the, how did they hunt the buffalo then? How did they hunt the buffalo? 
Oh, just Come by up, uh, horseback and chasing. Runner was uh, running up on him. The old Indian with a spear and bow and arrow. And our modern people with their, with their uh, guns. I myself ran down several buffalo using only a, uh, a revolver. Riding up close to them and firing on their left flank. Uh, how about other game? Not that uh, other game. Oh, that was abundant, of course. But game on the trail as we traveled was sometimes hard to find. Game at that time was shy. A large body traveling through the country necessarily made more or less And the game would scatter into the mountains and hide away. So that sometimes we even had to employ hunters to go out and get the game for our own, for our own uh, meals. Well, that was good. Well, Putting all the things on the trail. Uh, what would you say was the fertility of the soil then? Oh, of the course, necessarily and in the uh, bottoms, around through where the stream flowed through, the flat valley bottoms and the thick water valleys, all those western streams, the uh, fertility seems to be very good indeed. Of course, that's all proved by the, by the fine crop they raised when they came into production. Well, now, was there water in the streams in those days? Oh, yes, there was not much. The water was not conserved then. There were dry seasons when the streams almost go dry. But, uh, of course, at that time, early day, there's no irrigation, except in a very small way, so that they confined themselves to immediate vicinity of the water. But there was no They didn't dust depend upon rainfall at all. They did depend for, from, for such crops as they had upon irrigation, but in a limited way. Well, what did people do for amusement in those days? What were their amusements? Oh, I don't know. There's no amusement that we know it today. <laughs> they all went to bed early and got up early. I see. <laughs> uh, what, what about the social life? Oh, the course, life was occasionally another gathering of people for a dance, like the old-fashioned barn dance. All the ranchmen had their dancing night. That was the great amusement, I might say, of all, gathering the people all together for a dance. And the old time square dances almost universally at that time. All of us could find a fiddler or somebody who could uh, play music of some kind. Well, uh, a man who might have been out there at that time making a living on that land, uh, what did, how did he make his money? How much money was needed, or did he just buy well, barter they and trade? Make, so they were mostly concerned in making a living, mm -hmm. not for selling it so much. Mm -hmm. That came in mostly with the cattle business later. And also, when the overland uh, stage lines were running, by raising hay and such things for the service of the Pony Express and the overland stage and things of that kind. Those were places all had to be stocked with hay. They lived upon that almost entirely. And, of course, that's one of the first products, you might say, was that, of course, when the moment went in there, they began at once with a wheat crop. On the first year of their entrance into Salt Lake Valley, they had a wheat crop growing at once by sowing the wheat and corn, I should say, besides the wheat. Let's see. What do you recall, Mr. Jackson, as, in your opinion, the most interesting thing that uh, happened to you in your entire experience in the West? Do you have any one thing that you think would be an outstanding well, experience? Well, it's pretty hard to segregate uh, one, one item because my uh, <coughs> experience has been so... <coughs> would you want a glass of water? been so wide spread in general. Mm. Just, uh, that's right. Just take a drink. Uh, but I've always called the most interesting period of my life, the 10 years I spent in the West with the Hayden Survey. That's always been my most interesting period. New things to saw, new places to photograph, first things to bring to the attention of the world, to make the Yellowstone region known, to make the mountain, the Holy Cross known to the people, to make known to people the cliff dwellings of the South. All very interesting in them, things in themselves, but no one startling, dramatic, single incident, you might say. There are standout pounds like more or the rest. You have uh, probably been the first man to have looked upon, or the first white man at any rate, to have looked upon many of those natural wonders out there. Have you not been? Well, in a way, not the first to look upon them so much as to perpetuate, perpetuate them in pictures. Mm -hmm. 
pretty hard to say in this America of ours where a man has not been. That's true, But too. we're among the uh, first uh, people to follow on the t tales of those unnamed people, trappers and people of that kind, who may have seen these yes. things. But we were the first to make them publicly known. Well, what were some of those things that you made known for the first time to the rest well, of the country? Yellowstone, Holy Cross, the Cliff Dwelling, the uh, main Rocky Mountain chain of peaks, Fremont's Peak, and all the big, uh, the Teton Mountains, all the prominent features today in the scenic wonders of the West. I have seen some of those pictures you've made, Mr. Jackson, made on the tops of mountains, where you knew that it must have been tremendously difficult just to get to the point and carry that the That was the main part of my experience with the Hayden Survey, was carrying that cumbersome, very weighty photographic apparatus to the top of the high peak. The apparatus for making pictures arrived mounted for fully 100 pounds of weight you had to carry up. Of course, I had to have assistance. There were generally three of us. We'd carry our pack animals up the mountain as far as we could. Then we'd distribute their loads to our own soldiers, to our own shoulders, and carry it to the tops of the peak. I covered pretty nearly all of the high peaks of Colorado in that way, from the, 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 including Fremont and all the high peaks of Colorado, and carried up my water and all the apparatus and the cameras and everything that kind for making the pictures. Sometimes I had to spend nearly all day on top to get pictures between intermittent storms that come over the peaks. And now these days we think it's quite an achievement if a man goes up there carrying a minicam with him. Oh. <laughs> It's a uh, stage, playboy time. <laughs> playboy time. Uh, would you tell us something about the way you had to make pictures in those days? Some, of the, some of the way you had to make pictures, how you made the exposure. <coughs> Briefly, the our old process, before 1880, when the dry plate came into being, was what you call the wet collodion process. We carried out clean glass plates, a whole lot of them, a whole lot of chemicals collodions and developers and iron solutions and acid solutions and everything again, filters and trays and bottles and everything of that kind, besides a portable dark room to work in. We had to go into that little tent, take one of those clean glass plates, fill it with a collodion, immerse it in a silver bath of nitrate of silver, and while still wet, put in a plate holder and expose in the usual way. Then it had to be developed immediately after it while wet and the plate dried as well as we could, stored in a grooved box to protect it in that condition, and the camp had to be clothed with a protective varnish and packed away. I have tried, <coughs> on one occasion, by coaching my assistant, see how quickly we could make a picture from the arriving at the point where I wanted us to be made. We had to unpack the mule, of course, and uh, distribute the apparatus, set up a tent, get the camera ready, and then I'd go into that little tent and coat my plate and prepare it for exposure. And after development, it is that packed away, as I have said, and then put on the mule again. Under such conditions, with two assistants working with me, I've been, I've taken 30 minutes to make a picture. But ordinarily, it takes more time than that. And once located, well, of course, you can make a number of pictures with a comparatively short time. Exposure on the plate at that time averaged all the way from sometimes even to one second, up to five, ten, fifteen, or twenty seconds for an exposure. Extreme cases up to minutes instead of seconds. I expect in those days out there you've photographed many people, have you not, who have been a part of our West, and of our early history? We didn't photograph many people, many groups. We were rather limited in that account. We were out there, but it was just about so much work. We couldn't carry only the only a fixed quantity of glass, but that is heavy. We generally had, as I might say, for a season's work, about 400 glass plates. And we were intent upon the scenery. We didn't care about our own party. We didn't care about what they did themselves individually. We were interested in what they saw, new places, things of that kind. And towards the end of the season, if, uh, if uh, we, there were still things to be photographed that had not been uh, taken, well, we'd wash off from the old uh, group picture and use them for scenery. Of course, the scenery remained, but those people at that yes. must have regret in some cases. Uh, you, you must have known and been acquainted, at any rate, with a lot of those characters of the early West, were you not? They were not prominent in those days. We didn't think much of them. And it was all just one of us at the same time. 
Uh, of course, I met nearly all the prominent people, at least now the well-known people of that period. Would you like to mention some of those people of that day? Uh -huh. uh, would you like to mention some of those people of that day who played a part in making the way? Oh, of course, there was, first of all, our old geological survey people. Besides Hayden, there's Powell, and there's King, and there's Wheeler, and all the people associated with it. And, of course, nearly the eight men of the old, well-known scouts that figured largely in the uh, undercover period of the West, like Bill Hickman and Cody and, uh, and people and uh, people in Cheyenne and Denver, who uh, like Matt Madison and some other Masterson, some of those people whose names I don't recall just now. But they're all circling, more or less, during that late 1670 period. Well, Mr. Jackson, I, I just wouldn't know the questions to ask you to bring out the things that I know you'd like to say. Wouldn't you just like to go ahead and just talk now and and tell us all of the things that you remember and <clears throat> what you think of their importance, both of yesterday and as they might be in relation <clears throat> to things today? Well, you already have an inkling, have an outline of my story, but it's mostly concerned the survey period of the 60s and 70s. <clears throat> I began photography way back when I was 15 years old, way back from when I was 17 or 18 years old. And uh, pursuing that business with various galleries, it finally took me up into Vermont before the Civil War. There I got interested in the Civil War proceedings, of course, and went into a Vermont regiment and served down in the Army of the Potomac. Coming back from that into Vermont, I uh, pulled up stakes in Vermont on account of a disrupted love affair, as they call it, went west. That was in 1866, as already mentioned. That work took me to California and back, <coughs> returning from California behind a band of uh, about 150 Mustang ponies, driving about 2,000 miles across the country from uh, from uh, Los Angeles to uh, up through Salt Lake, back to Omaha. There, I thought I'd had enough of that kind of wandering and went into the photographic business. Set up a gallery of my own. And the band working on the Union Pacific Road, then building westward, holding up that road from one end to the other. That brought me in contact with Dr. Hayden, who was then running a survey of the Western Territory. He liked my work so well and thought it should be an important part of his own work, and he induced me to join the survey. I gave up on business in Omaha as a local photographer, and for the next uh, nine years, including, I worked with a survey. That, as I said, as I already mentioned, covered the most eventful period of my life, really. And from that time, I, when I quit the survey, I left Boston and went to Denver and set up a business myself. My work from that time began with the rapid development of the Western Railway System branching out everywhere, all over the West, Colorado especially, with the Rio Grande and the Santa Fe and the Southern Pacific, all those roads. They furnished me with private cars, crews, and engines and all that. And during the next 15 or 20 years, my work was almost entirely in following up the development of the Western Railroad. During that period, of course, I made a great many pictures for exhibitions, particularly for the Colombian Exposition in Chicago, 93. After that, I prepared a series of pictures over the Baltimore Ohio Road that I had made the previous year. The uh, publicity agent of that road, after the completion of that work, he conceived the idea of taking me around the world <coughs> with the Transportation Commission, so-called. So in the latter part of 94, with a party of five, we started abroad and I spent the next 18 months going all over the eastern, eastern continent. From uh, all the way from England over to the far points of the Far East, down to Australia and the Philippines and the and the Japan and finally to Vladivostok on the Pacific, and returned from there overland by sledge in the winter time, making a 3,000 mile trip over the snowy roads of uh, eastern Siberia, photographing all the way. Those pictures, by the way, being published in. Uh, Harper's Weekly during that period. Pretty, uh, weekly and all the issues of that paper during the latter part of 95 and 96. That covered one of my longest trips of that kind. 
because they took the whole route from Vladivostok to Moscow in covering that uh, trip in that year. We returned from that to New York, where we came back in the Depression period of the 90s, uh, late 90s, and that kind of threw me out of business. Until finally, I joined in with a color printing concern and went to Detroit in 98, and for the next 25 years, I engaged in color printing business, converting these photographs largely into color views, postcards largely. We turned out millions and millions of postcards, using all my old negatives negative made during the previous 40-odd years. I understand that you're the father of the postcard, Mr. Jackson. Well, that is a far-fetched assumption, I think. I, when I was in the Army, I sent home in every letter a little picture the size of an envelope that I had drawn out, over a whole lot of them. And when I gathered them, they came home, I, people, I gathered them up to show again. Being a picture similar to the postcard, to the uh, card picture, it uh, might have been assumed that the first to the postcard, although not mailed as such, although it was mailed in an, um, uh, in an envelope. I made a great many. A writer in the post here in New York presumed that to be uh, the origin, but I couldn't say. I, I don't think that's think as they logical an origin as... Okay. I think that's as logical an origin as anyone else yeah. can say. But I don't know when the picture being used for that purpose before that mm. time. The little picture card you made made different sizes and so on, but not the size of an envelope as a picture card as we know them today. You've been responsible for a great many million people, I expect, then, saying, <laughs> uh, wish you were here, <laughs> sending the picture where they were. Uh, in connection with your trip around the world, Mr. Jackson, since your eye had been uh, for natural beauty, primarily, yeah. and you'd had the opportunity of seeing a, a great deal of our country and then the opportunity to see uh, the beautiful nature spots of other countries, yeah. what, in your honest opinion, is, is the comparison there? Is America a beautiful country? Well, the aesthetic part of America is pretty well done. Photographers now are more intent upon Hollywood and their latest interest than they are on the scenery of the country. How, how would you say I'm the... Not the uh, I've been a landscaper, I've been a nature of, of uh, scenery unadorned in, in the country. Well, how would you say that our American scenery compares to the scenery of other nations? Oh, the there are little spots of it that are equal to and as attractive as anything you have abroad. Take the Tate Town, take the Jackson Hole country, for instance. Take our Yellowstone, which is unique. Take our Grand Canyon. Take our Yosemite. Things that cannot be paralleled anywhere else. And I think that we have here a great attraction that way, of course, as they have abroad. Of course, we haven't the Grand Alps, or haven't the Himalayas, and the great many things we haven't. But we have things equally attractive in a way, I think. People talk about the centenary of my work in the United States. I'm very happy to have it linked up here with the Geological Survey. And the connection with photography, which my light has been largely identified, I've covered a little more than 80 years of active service in photography coming into it on the very heels of the old primitive daguerreotype process and following through all its courses up to the present time, mostly in connection with public surveys in the West. Well, My early period across there was covered by sketches. Then I took up the work of the Geological Survey in 1870 and followed through all that decade of the 70s. And that brings me back here again after the 75 odd years to so join again with the old, the uh, explorers of today, Explorers Club and the Geological Survey and various allied organizations of that kind. My life has been devoted to picturizing the West. When I gave up photography and with the old processes, and I took the pencil and the paintbrush and I've uh, preserved many remembrances of the old trail in that way. Yes, go right ahead, mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson. Uh, for the last 15 years, as I retired from active business, I've been more active than ever in carrying on the story of the Old West. That's been largely in connection with the work of the, of the Oregon Trail Association, 
discovering my original route across the continent, as well as picturizing it now for future records of the old of the old west. Could I bring to it not only my original work in sketch and so forth, but the memory of all those things, which are still fresh in mind, and able to carry on the old story by picture and other means of that kind. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to meet the boys of the Geological Survey here. I come here for it nearly annually, although my home is now in New York. But I keep alive the old story, and from here I go west every year, still following the old trails, well, from the Missouri right. River to the coast, mm -hmm. as they call it, by foot and airplane and motor car and every imaginable way you can think of. I've covered, I think, put nearly every way of traveling across the continent. Well, I want to thank you very, very much, Mr. Jackson, for coming up here and giving us this opportunity of, of having your voice put here in this transcription so we may know these things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. This electrical transcription is an interview with William Henry Jackson made on the eve of his 98th birthday and recorded in the radio studios of the Department of the Interior, Thursday, April 3, 1941. Mr. Jackson was interviewed by Shannon Allen, director of the radio section of the Department of Interior. <laughs>